Okay, everyone, I think we're just going to try and get started now. So I'm again, I'm not going to keep you that long. Um, so I just want to say welcome uh, to the first day of Public Art Now Conversations. And thank you all so much for joining us in the virtual world. So my name is Gordia Coughlin. I'm the conference coordinator. and I've probably been in touch with many of you through email. So it's sort of nice to have us all in one space, I think, at the moment. So first, I'm just going to, if your microphone isn't already turned off, please make sure it is. And also just to draw your attention to make sure your view on Zoom is set to speaker view. So when we started planning this conference, we originally conceived this as an on-site event uh, to mark the development of Technological University of Dublin's new city campus at Grange Gorman. Um, however, as with many things over the last year or so, we were forced to adapt and to change and move on to this new online platform of the Zoom webinar. So negotiating this new situation brought with it many challenges, and if I'm very honest, also even disappointments. But it also provided us a scope to provide an even more robust program. So for example, we can now include more of you from around the globe uh, that we might not have been able uh, to attend otherwise. Uh, being alone has also allowed us to make contact with speakers from all over the globe as well without the need for flying and the cost to our collective carbon footprint. So in many ways, it is this ability, I think, to negotiate those complex social, physical and environmental realities and then adapt to these different challenges. That is also at the core of our thinking about public art now and the future of public art. So for example, our first conversation today in and out with public art and the contest of sight invites three artists who have contributed to the Grange Gorman Development Agency's public art program to reflect on their response to different ecologies of space and place. Later then this afternoon, our second conversation will explore the different process and policy of commissioning and funding public art from the Irish and European context. And it will question the future of its provision and the new challenges that it must respond to. So before we head into our first conversation then, I'm going to pass you over to Karen Corcoran, Head of School at the Dublin School of Creative Arts at TU Dublin. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Gráinne. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to Public Art Now Conversations on behalf of Technological University Dublin and the TU Dublin School of Creative Arts. I just want to speak briefly about the context for the event especially for those attending who might be from uh, outside Ireland, from other countries. Uh, TU Dublin is one of Ireland's largest universities with over 30,000 students and over 3,500 students studying across all areas of creative, performing, media, arts and architecture. Uh, over the last decade and a bit, about 12 years, TU Dublin has been developing a new campus here in this city quarter of Grange Gorman. It's actually located in the northwest of the old 18th century Georgian city centre of Dublin. Beginning with extensive consultation and involvement of local communities and with the Grange Gorman Development Authority and the Health Service Executive of Ireland, we developed a master plan for the campus and we moved our first about 1500 students, mostly art and design, on campus in 2014. Uh, we also opened a children's playground, a community garden, a primary health care centre, and we will have a full Educate Together primary school on campus in 2023. Our ambition is a campus without walls, and I think we're well on the way to achieving this. This September, COVID-19 permitting, uh, another 10,000 students and staff will join us here. A central feature of our plan for the new campus was the development of an art strategy with a major focus on public art. Uh, coordinated and organized by the Grange Gorman Development Authority, the Public Art Working Group was established and it launched one of the most ambitious public art projects in Ireland, The Lives We Live, in 2014. This program has been very successful and will culminate in the completion of a number of major commissions later this year. You will hear about some of them, uh, as Gronya said in the first session. We decided to hold this event at this stage of the public art program to give us all a chance to reflect discuss best practice, and also gain new insights about a wide-ranging and a very important art practice. Uh, hopefully, these new insights will inform the next phase of the development of our campus, and I hope the next three days will prove to be stimulating and informative for all of you. Thank you very much. Back to you, Gráinne. Great. Okay, so before we go into our first conversation, I'm just going to run really quickly through our housekeeping rules. 
Um, I think a lot of you have already seen this through our supplementary information booklet, but just to say that we're working on a policy of please keep your microphones off. Um, if you would like to ask a question to the panel, please use the Q&A function, which is down at the bottom of your screen. And we'll be choosing a selection of these then to be asked, you know, like given the time scales that we have left. Um, if you'd like to make a comment, share a resource, drop a link to something, please do so through the chat feature. So we're going to collect these and hopefully we'll be able to disseminate um, important links to everybody who's attended. Um, the other thing that I would like to say is that uh, these conversations are going to be recorded um, and they will be made available on various web platforms after the event. So with that in mind, I'm just going to go straight introducing um, Dr. Brian Fay and Caroline Crowley, who are chairing our first conversation. So Brian Fay is um, an artist and senior lecturer in fine art and visual culture at TU Dublin. He exhibits nationally and internationally and has recently been invited onto the Joseph and Annie Albers Foundation Residency Programme. His work is in the Arts Council Collection, National Drawing Collection Ireland, and collections of the Crawford Art Gallery, uh, Dunmiri Retown Art Collection, and the Office of Public Works. He holds a practice-led PhD from Northumbria University and was the winner of the 2014 Derwent International Drawing Prize and the 2016 AXA Drawing Prize. Um, Caroline Crowley then is the coordinator for Fingal Public Art. I am um, sorry there, just trying to get my script up. I am um, sorry about this. Now we've just lost some of the screen. Uh, Caroline Crowley is the Public Art Coordinator with Fingal County Council and committed to bringing contemporary art practice into all aspects of life in the county. She currently directs and manages the Council's art program infrastructure from 2017 to 2021, resort residency at Linder's Mobile Home Park, the Hive Sculpture by artist Gareth Phelan at Rogerstown Park, the Scaries Art Trail and a uh, guest at Newbridge House in addition to working commissioning as part of private development opportunities in the county and programming in the fields of heritage, art and ecology. She holds a BA in Art History from Trinity College Dublin, Masters in Art Administration and Cultural Policy from UCD and Masters in Visual Arts Practices from the Institute of Art and Design, Dunleary. She is the current chair of artist run organisation Palace Projects and Studios and co-authored Public Art uh, Publication, Local Authority, European Perspectives on Commissioning Public Art with Valerie Connor and Dr. Daniel Dewsbury. So over to you, Brian, enjoy the conversation. Thank you, Grania. Thank you very much, Grania, and thank you, Kieran. Um, just on, on behalf of myself and um, Caroline, we just want to welcome you um, to, uh, for joining us this morning. And um, we're just particularly um, delighted uh, to have um, our panellists, Alexandra Carr, Jenny Guy and Gareth Phelan with us uh, this morning. Just to frame this slightly, um, I just want to briefly give you a hint of the, the rationale behind this notion of in, out and with for this session. So while my own um, uh, practice it doesn't involve uh, uh, public art aspects. I have been involved as an artist representative and uh, recently the TU Dublin representative for a number of, of commissions for city councils and county councils and most recently for the Grange Gorman site. So it really had me thinking about the nature of the works that have been taking place um, on this site. So the session I thought we could use as this in, out and with as, as, as a framework. And simply it came through conversation around that there is an internal work, there is an external work, and there's a collaborative practice, and that each are these distinct and diverse responses that might speak to some ideas of um, how particular practices respond to a particular site and open up through the specifics of this site, maybe open up more general and kind of fundamental questions around issues within um, public art practice and themes that will no doubt be sort of unthreaded 
uh, over the next few sessions over the next coming days. So I'd just like to hand over to Caroline, who will give a run through of how we'll be working this session. Thank you, Brian, and thank you to Public Art Now for inviting me to be part of this uh, session. It's um, it's well overdue to have such a, a great lineup of um, uh, speakers uh, speaking about public art in Ireland today. Um, so personally, just from my own uh, perspective, I'll add a little to what Brian said. Um, I'm very much a practitioner in my work. I'm very much on the ground in the local authority. Um, the title of the session, just to follow on, the in, out, and with, as simple as it sounds, needs no explanation for anyone on this panel, as it sums up very succinct, succinctly what it is to navigate a public practice um, under the auspices of an institution, whatever that may be. Um, and what is at stake, really, in the personal and the role of the insider and outsider? And everyone, certainly on this session, has experienced that feeling, um, even extended to Grange Gorman as they conceived of a new model campus on the site of a former um, psychiatric hospital, the Grange Gorman um, facility. Um, so it's in the next few days, everyone on these sessions will be getting right to the heart of the matter, the realities, the policies, the politics and the practice of delivering public art in our lives. So um, the session that we're, we're looking, looking at today, I just said I'd outline some of the choreography of the event, uh, to use an arts term. Each of the panelists uh, that we have here today have prepared uh, a talk on their, their work and their current thinking. We will pause after each uh, panelist's presentation to ask them um, a, a general question and reflection. Um, hopefully then we'll get a chance to end with a general discussion between the panelists and a chance to answer some of the questions from, from you guys out there. So as Grania said, if you're looking at questions or you want to ask a question, please put it in the, um, in the Q&A. And over the course of the session, um, Roisin and Grania will feed them to Brian and he may group some he might group some questions, some themes, and we'll hope to get to answer as many as we can. Um, we have been tasked to finish and um, promptly at 12.30, so we're going to try and stick to that because the Public Art Now team are working very hard to deliver the next session and this is day one, so we will we will honour that promise. Um, so it is without further ado that I am delighted to welcome our first panellist, um, Alexandra Carr. Now, Alexandra, as you may have noticed in the conference literature, is creating a really exciting new work on site here. The Solaris Nexum um, is described as a monument to uh, solar to to solar connection and reflect reflecting on how technological advances have impacted on the human association of sun and light from Neolithic times to the present day. I mean, even that description alone um, really just wants me to know more. So over to you, Alexandra. Um, take it away. Thank you, Caroline, um, and thank you to Public Art Now for having me. It's good to be here. Um, I'm going to launch straight into my talk because I've got a lot to say and 10 minutes is never enough. Um, so here we go. So I'm Alex. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about just touch on my practice in general, uh, then focus on the, the sculpture at Grange Gorman and give you a little bit of an insight into the broader context of that and how that work and the current climate has changed the way I'm thinking and working. So, is it going to do anything? Right, so um, this is the cloud of unknowing. Now, my my practice spans drawing, sculpture, installation, video, and it's generally quite ex experimental. And um, I'm, I feel like I'm reinventing the wheel every time I've a piece of work which has never been done before. Um, but with everything I do, there is a sense of movement and flow and change and transience, and also a sense of. Um, presence and absence, so I sort of play with the border of materiality. Now this was a piece that I made, a um, nice specific piece for a church in Mickley. This ran for about four months and the cloud of unknowing comes into being whenever the audience is present and then ceases to be when there's no one there. So there's that direct um, uh, 
interaction with the audience, but um, very much playing with this idea of pregnancy and asking. So that one ran for four months, four or five months, I think it was. Um, this one is Aoife. Um, I was invited to, uh, to make a site-specific work at Pembroke College um, in the Damon Wells Chapel in Oxford University. I thought I'd be get, getting a bit, bit more notice and they were talking about next year, but they actually said, no, we want you to do this next week. So I rose to the challenge and took down everything reflective in my studio. And I played around for about two, a day, two days until I hit upon this technique that I developed to kind of weave um, nylon monofilament throughout the chapel in order to... Am I muted? Can everyone see that? Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm getting notifications, sorry. Yeah, that's there. So, so I, put, I developed this technique to um, weave nylon monofilament through the chapel to give this sense of a structure without real presence. So as, the, as you move around the piece, this orb of light follows you. Um, but it's, it's never quite solid. Um, now this piece, um, they, they neglected to tell me that the, the following day they had a wedding in that chapel. And I'd gone ahead and filled the whole thing with nylon. So this piece actually existed for a, a total of about two to three hours, just long enough for me to document it before I had to cut the whole thing down and shove it in a Sainsbury's carrier bag, which is now um, aptly labelled ether on the shelf in my studio. So that gives you an idea of the sort of the, the transience of my work. Um, now, Solaris Nexum is totally different. I will sort of briefly run through the conceptual idea of this. So I, I've, I've taken the idea of a solar connection from a, a, the Neolithic period where we're, it's a more instinctive way of living, a more intimate relationship with the environment through to the Renaissance where we have this sort of shift from a geocentric to a heliocentric universe primarily brought about because of um, the invention of microscopes and telescopes. So we sort of become gods of our own making and become very analytical. And then it's sort of tipping towards the hope for a, a technical utopia where we take that knowledge and that remembrance of an intimate relationship with nature and try and combine the two to work towards um, a, a more responsible, more harmonious future. Um, so it's sort of taking lots of different perspectives and weaving them throughout history and the present and making them current and um, relevant. So um, formally, I was sort of drawing inspiration from uh, the site at Newgrange, so Neolithic sites. And, and this sort of signifies the outward sort of looking nature of, of looking at the cosmos. Um, and referencing optics. So these, the idea of these two lenses is very much apparent in the work with two panels and reflection and, um, and refraction. So that sort of signifies the inwards looking nature of, of how we became that analytical self. And, and it also references the um, renewable energy, the architectural elements of solar farms and renew renewable energy, where we can sort of bring all those spheres of being together. So formally, this structure is are the catenary structures that the whole sculpture hangs upon. And on top of that, we superimpose the DNA helix structure to physically embed the human connection to, to the celestial spheres. And then we repeated that five times. Then that gave us this, um, these intersection points where we could then overlay triangular panels of decreasing size. Um, these panels are two-way polycarbonate mirrors. So they change in response to how much light is coming at them or behind them. So you either see a reflection or you see right through them. So that hung, hangs on those, those points in order to reference all the sacred geometry and um, geometry in nature that is often a theme in my work. And then we used um, point attractors to mimic the solar panel orientation of the re renewable energy that we were talking about earlier. 
Um, and in the center of that, I wanted to make a reference to the Neolithic sites and how um, they physically interact with uh, celestial points in the year. So at the center of Solaris ne Nexum, there is a bead column that at a particular point, the uh, summer solstice, there is a mirror at the very top of the sculpture that the light hits at the summer solstice and is redirected through the entire sculpture through this bead column. So that's, that's a nod to those Neolithic structures. And here is a fly through, a render, quite an early render of the sculpture. So over the course of the day, the light will change and both the environment and the people will be reflected in it. And it will take on the colors of, of the night sky or the day sky. And these are a few ranges of it. So you get a different sense of it from every perspective. And I just want to sort of briefly uh, mention that obviously with any public artwork, there's a, an element of engineering that goes into this. And at first that was an, a necessity, but that's become increasingly more sort of conceptually appropriate given the context of what's ha ha happening in the building. So. Now, um, making this during COVID has been no easy task. But aside from that, it's been um, quite difficult to reconcile as well, because when COVID hit, the world stopped, we heard the birds singing again. And um, me making this statement about the solar, solar connection seemed a little bit hypocritical when I was filling the world with polycarbonate and steel. So it, it had me in a real conflict in my practice. And it got me thinking about, um, you know, all my work is about transience and, and my, my medium for transience in Solaris Nexum is definitely light because it changes the whole thing constantly. Um, but it started me questioning whether our value system is right and whether we should look towards having more public artworks that are intentionally um, have a lifespan and they dissolve or they, you know, do we really need these in, in perpetuity? Um, so then it kind of took me back to my uh, original roots. Uh, a lot of what I do, um, about manipulating natural phenomena and using those processes. So on the left, uh, these are uh, drawings made through uh, kinetic artworks using magnetism. And on the right, that's liquid porcelain being manipulated by sound. So I, I kind of looked back a little bit and started looking at how other artists are using natural materials and using organisms to grow materials. Um, now I often work with um, a lot of scientists um, and increasingly so, the most recent one being material imagination, it's becoming more intensely collaborative. So material imagination was um, a three month project where I was the, uh, a fellow at the Institute of Advanced Studies at Durham University. And an, uh, a sort of uh, interdisciplinary group came together to talk about developing biological smart materials together. And what we discovered really was that, that not to, to just go into that task, but that actually that dis discussion was a much bigger problem. And it became more about ethics and responsible innovation and developing the right methodology to work together um, in a, a more holistic, harmonious way. Um, so that's led me more towards sort of placing my practice a little bit closer to the hybrid arts. So material imagination and a few other projects that I have going on at the moment um, is focusing on this intersection between the two where you're not quite sure where experiment begins and the artwork ends. Um, and I'm really interested in this, um, in this space. And what's coming out of it is the idea of co-authorship where maybe there's this third space where you're not just an artist or just a scientist, you may be both at the same time. Um, so that's brought me on to um, a research grant that I'm doing with the Arts Council, which is basically to do, develop grown sculptures. And that might be through uh, fungi or bacteria or salt, um, a whole range of things. Um, 
So I'm working on this intersection of art and science and experiment, but allowing the material to have autonomy. So I just place the framework and, 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 and let it do what it does. So actually this tension that I've had and the, the, the sort of existential angst about producing a permanent artwork with a carbon footprint, I've come to realize actually Solaris Nexon is a call to arms. And the current work that I'm doing, the smaller scale, more experimental stuff, is actually the work I'm doing on the ground in response to my own call to arms. So I think there's a space for all of that. Um, and, I, and I think there's a communication between the two, but I, I've not quite understood where that is and, and how that fits together. But I'm quite excited by all the possibilities that those, those ideas can bring together. So, in many ways, I think Solaris Nexum has got a lot to answer for in my practice, and um, and and I look forward to seeing where it goes. So, that's me. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, I just, I suppose you just you touched on some things there, um, and your the presentation was amazing just the the detail and the the steps that you showed us all that's a real insight actually and it's very generous of you and thank you um for people who wouldn't understand or wouldn't get to see the back story of of an artist practice so you you really you really illustrated it for us um you know this that was really fascinating about the the work your work and the future of materials so with with your inquiry as it is now and as you said the impact of, on your practice of the Solar, solaris nexum like how will the how do you think the future then will affect your work in grange gorman like even your thinking about the work or how it sort of um how, how it exists if you are inquiring on a kind of a call to arms to reduce maybe the objects that we've created to put in the world um I know this might sound like something you wouldn't expect an artist to say about their own work, but I think if Solaris Nexon does what I intend it to do, then it should become irrelevant, okay. if that makes sense. So if we do move towards this future that's more holistic and more mindful about the materials we use and more responsible, then to look back at Solaris Nexon might be a shock to those people. It might, um, it might jar and make, us, make them go, well, how would anyone produce work that didn't repair itself or, or clean itself or, you know, put, or put something back into the world that was a, a benefit? Um, and I'm obviously talking, you know, a long way into the future, but ironically, for, it, it's, for it to do its job, it should become archaic in a way. Okay. Does that make any sense? Yeah, and, and just with that then for you, like in terms of the commission, like when when is the work, when does the work leave you in a way? When is it, when does it become um, Gorman's responsibility or the campus <laughs> responsibility and it's, your, it's, not, it's no longer <laughs> your responsibility? When does it belong in Ireland? Well, I mean, you know, there's a sort of, there's a very full technical answer to that in terms of when it's signed over, but yeah. actually um, it's quite interesting to ask that idea about ownership of an artwork once it's done, because I have two particular pieces that I have a very different relationship with to everything else. And one, is, one is Cloud of Unknowing that I showed you at the beginning, and the other piece is Phi, which is a porcelain work on, on the wall. And, Usually with most commissions, I'm, I'm sort of so into it for so long that I'm frankly sick of the sight of it and I don't want to see it again. But with those two pieces, it kind of took on a life of its own. And as soon as they were installed and I stood back, I kind of went, oh, who did that? And it's, it's something totally alien to me. I'm totally removed from it. Um, and I think those are the ones that are, that are really special that you've hit upon something. Um, and actually it's, it's ironic that it's with the cloud of unknowing because I often describe artistic practice as the cloud of unknowing. You have all these sort of strands of ideas that come together and you just kind of have to trust it like a faith. And at some point 
they all come together and make sense. Um, and that's exactly what happened with those two pieces is that it just kind of I facilitated what, what it needed. So in a, in a sense, I would never was part of that process. Um, and I think that changes from practice to practice and artist to artist, but that's my personal experience of, of that ownership. I don't, I'll be able to answer that more fully once the Lars Nexum is up. Um, and then just, I mean, there's such big ideas in your work. And I mean, your, your call to arms, I, I love even that term that you're sort of looking at the future of materials, but also just, I mean, in public art, in, in nature, nothing exists alone. You work with a lot of people. You're, a lot of people are required to, to, to be part, part of your work. So you mentioned the engineering being sort of central to Solaris, Solaris Nexum, but also um, just all the fields of scientific inquiry. When you're in that space of um, collaborating and, and learning, what is that transference of knowledge? Like obviously you're bringing your artistic practice and your thought process to a particular scientific inquiry, but what is the kind of, um, what is the sort of, um, what, what are the traces left in the scientific community by having that exchange with you, if, if you know what I mean? Um, well, at the beginning of my practice, I think it was a more traditional exchange of knowledge than it is now. Um, you know, you have a meeting as a mind and you exchange knowledge and you go away and you do your separate things. But over the course of my practice, I've met more and more people, more and more scientists who are quite progressive and ambitious and really forward thinking in, in creating this third space that I was talking about before. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the scientists that I talk to kind of, I get a feeling they want to be artists. <laughs> so there's this sort of, um, there's a real meeting of minds in the middle um, but there is a definite intention with the scientists that I'm currently working with that the um, scientific research that goes on is directly informed by the, by the artist. So it changes the course of, of, the, of the research. And not only that, they're kind of questioning uh, scientific methodology and, and combining the two practices and, and the similarities of them. And, um, and it has actually created new um, lines of research and material imagination. Um, I was working with uh, Dr. Margarita Stekova and she, she through a line of questioning about um, how membranes stretch, uh, we came sort of to hit, a, hit heads upon heads and she, um, so, well, I don't know, understand why you would ask that question, why it would do this rather than this, what you're trying to prove. And I was like, I'm just asking a question because we're playing. And something changed in her and she's like, oh, I get it. You don't know the answer. And it took her on a different line of questioning. That's now turned into a new research project. Um, so I, it, it's that bit that I find really exciting, but I think that's I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg. We're just scratching the surface of that project. And another one as well, which I won't talk about that because it's a bit too early, mm -hmm. um, but they're both very exciting. And they're scientists that I think are leading the way in a new discipline that is very much needed for this um, technical utopia that I'm hoping for. Okay, I'm so fascinated by that and the future materials and the, I don't know, and the, prospect of maybe we that we mightn't even have or we'd have we might even have any objects left in the world in the future <laughs> or maybe that everything would be renewable and what does that mean I have so many other questions that I'd probably talk to you when you come over to Ireland sometimes yes, but, but I don't want to delay anyone else and um, so I and I will, we'll come back to that later I'm sure the others will have something to say also and um, I'll hand you back over to Brian Fay and um, who's going to introduce our next speaker thank you Alexandra I'll talk to you soon thank you Thanks so much, Caroline. Thanks, Alex. Um, there's so many rich ideas already kind of, you know, scribbling frantically here around autonomy, ownership, collaboration, artists' hats, roles, legacy, permanence, impermanence. And some of that obviously um, overlaps into the work of our next speaker, Jenny, Jenny Guy. So we're delighted to have um, Jenny to, 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 to speak with us. Um, she brings a wide experience to the, um, to the conference, working with many hats as uh, curator, artist, researcher, 
um, public art commissioner and consultant, writer, and um, I suppose most acutely for this uh, piece is her, um, uh, that she's the director and founder of, of Art School. So her practice with Art School is, it's not object based in many ways, and it works with the kind of collaborative and, discur and discursive framework. So with the selection of, of matching artists to particular schools and particular scenarios and to uh, particular workshops or, or residency. And it throws up really interesting ideas, maybe that's been unthreaded a little bit already around notions of collaboration, artist voice, uh, ownership, and, and where legacy uh, resides. And, and, and what role all that plays and what role is all the invisible work that takes place for Jenny as somebody who orchestrates these scenarios and context. So Jenny, I'd just like to invite you to um, give your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I'm just going to share my screen. And Are we in? Good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, hi everyone, and and thanks to to Caroline and Brian for inviting me to to this panel, and also to Gronia and Kiron, and everybody who's organising this very special event and program, uh, and specifically uh, to the Lives We Live strand that supported the projects that I'm going to talk through. So I decided to focus for today on on the work that I developed in in Grange Gorman, and uh, so this panel is it, it's interesting. For me because the projects that I developed in Grange Gorman took place in 2016 and 2017 so that's already five years in the past so although both works have connected with other works evolved um, in the years since and Brian you uh, you wrote the first text for the work I developed in Grange Gorman and it's titled A Site of Change the master plan and, and and you wrote a line change is an arc of transition from past present to future. So this phrase is in the, the spirit of the questions that I, the, or the thinking that I have in mind today. And so I hope that some of these reflections will, uh, will support the, the panel discussion in drawing attention to the complexity of legacy in the context of public art making and, and commissioning. So uh, the project that I developed in Grange Gorman is titled The Master Plan, and it has two parts. The first is simply bearing this title and the second is called I'll be in your camp, will you be in mine? And uh, I chose the title The Master Plan to really root the project in a reflection of what was and what continues to be a period of, of major urban uh, redevelopment in Grange Gorman and in the wider Dublin 7 region. For me, this process was uh, a key component of the site uh, through which these wor works took place. And uh, so this, uh, as Brian mentioned, this project in Grange Gorman is part of a larger curatorial project called Art School that I've been working on for many years, which I will describe in, in more detail later in, in this presentation. So for the master plan, I invited artists Ella de Berka and John Beatty to work with primary students of the Dublin 7 Educate Together National School. And at the time, the school was housed in um, prefabricated buildings in Grange Gorman Lower, while the new school building is, is being constructed as part of the Grange Gorman development. So thus, the, or the project was, was uh, kind of thus rooted in this transitory state as, as an invitation to the students to, to imagine alternatives of what school could be. Um, so Ella and, and John, they worked with the students to um, develop many things, but one of them was a spoken word opera based around three central questions. What is school for? What was school for? And what will school be for? So the work was developed using hand gestures with which the students could conduct each other to produce vocal assemblages. And so within a, a shared acoustic space, these universal questions and many individual answers rose to the, the surface. So the, the first, these first took place in, in the classrooms and then out, outside, um, outdoors, beside the site where the new school was being constructed. So I'm gonna show you a quick clip of video just to give you a sense of, of, of this process. So 
So, um, so this project had many other dimensions, but I'm going to leave it at this just for the, uh, within this short presentation. So the second part of the project, um, I'll be in your camp, will you be in mine? It took place a year later in 2017. And I worked with another school, St. Paul's CBS, locally known as The Brunner. And it's located down the road from TU Dublin, where many of Ireland's strongest, uh, strongest artists are teaching in, in a third level context. And I, here I wanted to connect these two communities of learning to have secondary students from the Brunner exploring the context of art making in the university campus, but also to have an artist from TU Dublin working within the Brunner in the domain of, of the younger students. So I chose to work with Naomi Sex and Carl Burke, both teaching in TU Dublin at that time. So we developed works in both sites where with Naomi exploring printmaking and Carl developing one minute sculptures and architectural assemblages by reconfiguring their classroom. So again, I want to give you very quick glimpses of, of both parts of these uh, projects. This is actually uh, second year. So this is the first semester, uh, semester of second year. And this- Were all these people in the same group? Um, all these guys would be first year. So maybe just a couple of years older than you guys. Um, mm. Not, you know, some of them are coming straight from school, yeah. so like 18, 17, 18. And what are you, what are you doing them completely on their own or did you just help them? Well, I showed them how to do it yeah. and I showed them the different um, ways to get a better effect. Yeah. Um, but most of the time they're doing it themselves, they're coming up with the ideas themselves. So the students are really trying to make, they're trying to deal with ideas in lots of different ways and they're using printmaking to do that. But a bridge in a building kind of, it's the same thing as a language, right? Yeah. It's all about balance and structure yeah, and, and support. support. Yeah. Support. Supporting what people want. So it's funny, if you come over here, it feels like this table is actually going to get sucked down to the floor. Good. We started with a flat triangle on the ground and then elevated down and kind of became this 3D shape but still retained the 2D triangles. And then we put the red tape around the entrances as like a prism almost to keep people out and keep whatever's in it. In it. Um, so just to, to point out that this work here behind me uh, with this kind of gold and, and grey detailing that this is um, the, the work or the, the, the assemblage that this student is, is, is talking about. And, in this moment. So I just thought it was a nice um, reference point. Um, but watching these videos, um, the, the projects appear grounded in the specific time in which they took place. And, and this is particularly acute as we are looking at students in school, uh, a setting which frames a time in, in their lives where they, where they are evolving so quickly. Uh, so the, the short time that they engage with this project is fleeting, uh, but, but these works have have continued to grow. So here um, is an image. It's an install image. Um, the, basically, that the master plan it informed a new commission within the exhibition. It's very new school, which was a group show that I curated at Rural Red Art Centre in 2017. And here, the project was distilled into the form the form of a floating bookshelf with a series of white books lying face up. On, on each spine, there's a different answer to one of the central questions from the master plan as, as um, and it's printed as the title. So from underneath the shelf, um, there's, a, uh, there's a discrete set of speakers playing out the spoken word opera. So the books have titles like, slowly become a place in society, a place where children learn things that robots can't teach for becoming the perfect housewife, for men to be successful at business, to be educated and responsible when you're older, for learning how to learn. So these phrases, they took on a, a new life away from the school, away from Grange Gorman, extending beyond the time in, in which they were originally voiced. So then more recently, uh, the master plan was revisited within the context of two of the essays within the book curriculum, Contemporary Art Goes to School. This is a new volume that I edited and published last year with Intellect Books. 
and basically a curriculum that explores the intersection of contemporary artistic practice and school education. So here I invited writers and curators with different artworks I've developed through the larger art school project framework that I've been evolving from 2014 to 2020, including the projects in Grange Gorman. So the book provides a space in which the temporality of the individual projects can expand, not within a space of legacy, but within a space of continued active production. So I want to conclude by reading from the curator and writer Juan Canella's essay from Curriculum, which focused on the master plan and the context in which it was developed at Grange Gorman. So Juan's essay brings the concerns of the projects that I've developed with John, Ella, Naomi and Carl back to the surface. So uh, he writes, another pertinent question also related to the particular context in which the master plan has developed. How could we learn to not be compliant functioning agents of a dominant social and economic system, but create the possibility for critical voices to appear? We need to develop projects and initiatives in our schools and pedagogical institutions whose processes not only share artistic knowledge with the students, but also infect all their learning structures. We should open the methods and the objectives to the interventions of those who act as guides and we should find ways of generating processes of proximity among the different agents involved, offering empowerment to the students and opening space for uncertainty when becoming political subjects. So one's idea interests me, particularly with the process based artwork, such as the master plan. I don't, I don't always see a clear resolution concerning where the, the work stops and, and the legacy begins, as works like this have the tendency to be reactivated alongside other gestures. So for me, one of the purposes of publishing this book is to try to create a space in which these kinds of questions and uncertainties regarding the intersection of, of contemporary art, education, and the development of uh, more specific public artworks can take shape. And um, I'll leave it at that and, and look forward to, to picking up on some of these threads afterwards. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jenny. That again, it, there's, there's a huge kind of richness and, and crossovers happening between um, both presentations or, already. Um, there's kind of three things just struck me. So I might just unfold them out that the, um, this way. The, the first one is around process. Could you talk to us a little bit about, I mean, what, what you show there is the visible outcome. It's the, it's the work that the, that the artists that you've chosen to work with a particular school, with a particular group of people, and, and, and we look at the, the outcomes or the representation of their interaction. But could you talk a little bit about the sort of that invisible role for you? How do you orchestrate this? How do you curate this? Um. It's, I guess it's a time when, um, I guess it's a different type of visibility um, when it's behind the scenes and like the stage, it's, it's a different stage. The, the stage is, is, is the school and all the negotiations with the funders and the artists and, and, and the students. And um, so in a, in, a, in a weird way for me, it's, I, I feel very visible in that moment because I'm kind of a, a, a very focal point with the artists and the students before you know the, the the project kind of um, materializes to its other public in in in, in a state in, in that sense. Um, yeah, so it, it is an interesting um, kind of notion that the visibility or invisibility. And then other times I um, I kind of drive the visibility of these projects in other ways because often I'm behind the camera shooting the work or, or making you know. A, a, not always, but often. So in that sense, it has that kind of classic moment of rendering the, 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 the photographer or videographer kind of invisible, but vis highly visible in other ways. Um, but I do think that when I think about the visibility of the curator in general with these types of very experimental projects, that they really need to think about um, kind of getting their elbows out to get a seat at the, at the table for, um, for example, with systems like Creative Schools or Creative Associates, um, which are larger national initiatives, um, 
where there's lots of partnerships for forming, um, at least in my understanding, that sometimes that the, the role of the curator who can really keep this kind of rich, complex territory kind of going and you know provoking questions, um, if, you know that that's kind of interesting. But then I guess the you know creating or, or deciding to do like curriculum <laughs> the book for me was an important gesture in, in a sense in terms of visibility and, and the discourse um, because it does put my otherwise invisible role kind of forward as, as editor in, in this other kind of space. Yeah yeah and it's, it's something that Alex mentioned earlier about the nature of collaboration and, and authorship so for, for, for you, like you, you, you have a certain intention in mind, obviously, um, maybe the school has a certain intention in mind, maybe the artist has a certain in, in, intention in mind. So there's a kind of invisible, invisible outline or, or curriculum that each person is working to. What, what for you makes that successful? Or how do you, how do, how, how do you kind of calibrate the outcomes? Um... That's a very complex question, and I really liked what Alexandra was talking about when she, you know, during her presentation around um, like the hybrid space and the hybrid or the third space and the hybrid practice. Um, I think on a practical um, uh, kind of level, the first essay in in the book actually deals. Uh, it's written by Nathan O'Donnell. It kind of opens up the the discourse. It's called the outline as a weapon, and um, I think because in our kind of conversations before, you know, uh, when he was commissioned to, uh, to write the piece, I, I kind of explained that the outline as a template um, was, that was something that I stumbled upon in the early days of, of making these works. And as a document specimen, it can be quite a formal thing. I, I was really fascinated by them. And, um, but then as the projects grew, and I would invite an artist to work in a school and realizing that there was all these different communities and quite a lot at stake actually um, to, to invite an artist in a practice, you know, who, who an artist who isn't necessarily at all versed in working in a school, um, but seeing it as a new space to potentially make work and collaborate collaboratively. Um, so each artist, you know, would interpret it and, um, and I'd always really look forward to see what they were putting forward. Um, but as Nathan, he, he really kind of identifies that it acts as this type of a buffer um, mm -hmm. between an, a very exper experimental artistic process and a school system, which requires kind of really practical elements to be set in place in concrete terms because it's a school. And um, so I see it as, as a, passport or an icebreaker but I love the fact that um, Nathan calls it you know a, a weapon but it is something that is it's a maneuver every time because every school every artist you work with is different every school every context is different but it's it's um yeah I think just the last thing I wanted to ask was that you had you had a lovely phrase there that you saw the book um not just as a as a space of legacy but production so for you, are these, are these forms of adaptation of an original idea or do they each have kind of agency and autonomy? Um, I think what I'm hoping is, is that through, you know, having done so many different experimental projects in schools and really um, by, by, by inviting other writers, other thinkers to kind of look through them and not as, as kind of in, 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 a, in a documentary sense, like there is a documentary visual essay in the middle of the book, but really to open it up as a space of discourse. That's my intention or that's my, my hope with mm -hmm. the book, that, um, that really the projects are, are activated, um, are still activated in, in, in this book. Yeah, so again, it's that kind of future future looking thing Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. OK, that's great. Um, thanks so much, Jenny. Um, Caroline, um, I'll hand back to you for Garrett. Thank you, Brian. Um, so our, our next artist, uh, Garrett Phelan, is a multidisciplinary artist working predominantly in the medium of sculpture, both physical and social. Um, he is a skilled collaborator and a deep listener to the narratives that have emerged within the socio-economic and political conditions of his own time. And this is demonstrated through his work with youth, 
with education, with direct provision. Um, he's deeply committed to the concept of art with function and the value of art as a tool for social change. Bureaucracy is, um, is his comfort zone and um, collaborations are his opportunity. He is deeply committed to fairness, to the protection of the environment, his family and the notion that art can indeed change the world. I'll give, hand you over to Gareth Phelan. Hi hey, folks, thanks Caroline and um, thanks everybody and um, thanks Alex and Jenny. It was brilliant and uh, interesting to hear how you know how I share a lot of your own uh, thoughts and ideas. Um, so I'm just going to kick off and try and fit uh, everything into 10 minutes, uh, which I'm probably going to fail miserably at, but um, I shall do that. And uh, let me just get it up here, full screen. So um, I've chosen a couple of projects, um, three or four, uh, to just to talk through. And um, so for those of you that wouldn't know me or know my practice at all, um, I generally present them through independent uh, FM radio stations. I set up sculptural installations, drawing installations, photography, animation zines, text ephemera, and I do that in, in both in, you know, in different scales in, in gallery and non-gallery spaces. Uh, it's a very broad practice and, um, you know, what I'm presenting here are uh, a few re uh, recent ones. Um, my first formal um, entry into the art making world really was um, the creation of, and this is you know, these projects that I'm putting forward are, are projects that I view in the public realm. I wouldn't uh, use the term public artist for myself. I'm just an artist. So if I need to work with a lot of people, I work with a lot of people. If I need to work outdoors, I work outdoors. If I need to work indoors, I work indoors. And um, I keep it quite simple like that. Uh, but this project was uh, ART Radio, and it was located in the Irish Museum of Modern Art in 1994. And sound and, you know, wasn't uh, widely available or considered or really acknowledged in the art world in Ireland at that time. And uh, I've been working in IMA quite a long time. So I decided to set about cr using IMA as, as uh, a vehicle to receive and engage and, and get a license and um, get the Arts Council to fund it. And we put on a two week um, uh, uh, project called ART Live. And you, and you can go and um, listen to that on Bandcamp. And one of the, one of my attractions to radio is this alternate space um, for experiencing something like, and I view sound as sculpture. So um, for me, I learned to love and interact and, and integrate um, bureaucracy into my work. Um, uh, you know, it's quite a, a daunting thing to try and set up a large radio station or uh, and that's kind of off-putting, but rather than see it in that context, I saw it as a challenge at that young, uh, at that stage when I was quite young. And um, I learned really not to be afraid of difficult administrative language and instead embrace it. Em embrace it. And through the course of that, and, and once I set up this alternative space within the museum, radio kind of raised a lot of interesting ideas for me. Um, the, the, the experience of listening to an artwork that can be simultaneously public and private uh, is, it was really uh, beautiful to me, that idea. Radio transcending boundaries of the museum and the legacy and the baggage associated with contemporary art museums and galleries. Suddenly, you know, um, radio can engage people directly if presented to them properly. Um, and radio was fully democratic and um, everybody generally has a radio so as a public space it was for me exceptional at that time and still continues to be and is a huge uh, uh, important part of my practice and it really that particular project set a marker of possibility and ambition for me uh, moving forward and um, like I say there's, a, there's an archive available of it there and this is the license which uh, you know took a lot of energy and took a lot of uh, 
collaboration and took a lot of negotiation to achieve using one agency, uh, official agency, which is the Irish Museum of Modern Art, not against, but to, to another, which was the Independent Radio and Television Commission. So um, I learned how to kind of orchestrate different institutions to work for my benefit as an artist to kind of uh, develop a, a, a much, um, uh, to develop really the language uh, of, of contemporary art. And in this instance, it was, you know, creating a platform for visual artists who wanted to use sound and for all, also others that were around the world using it. So there was about two, 300 artists involved, invited in from all around the world to be involved in this project. So um, I'll move on to the highproject.com. You can go to the highproject.com and look at the high project. And uh, this was the very first um, percent for art project I did. And um, I became very interested in the idea of uh, art and functionality. And this is, uh, it's a 21st century monument that I have dedicated to the people of Fingal County Dublin and their proximity to and relationship with the landscape. Uh, I started the project in 2006. This, uh, there's, the project's in four parts. This is the Hyde sculpture. The Hyde sculpture was eventually um, realized in this, con in this way in, in 2015. We let it a year for, uh, to season, and then we've, you know, slowly uh, introduced it into the into the locale area, of, which is situated in Lusk, County Dublin, North County Dublin, to the local community and to wider populations. And um, it's commissioned by Fingal County Council as a permanent functional public artwork, and um, it's really shaped uh, by its its role as a shared space and a space for uh, creative actions. And it's also fully accessible uh, for uh, disability. And um, so we create different events there and, uh, um, and it's used to observe the wildlife, the bird life on the Rogerstown estuary. And uh, you know, we engage with it in many different ways. And um, currently, we're producing small films that are available on the website uh, that are music inter musical interventions uh, called Once Upon a Sound at the Heights Sculpture. And we've invited uh, Donald Deneen, who's a well known um, uh, DJ, uh, radio broadcaster, to create these works for us. And um, I think all of my projects would have a very personal. Uh, involvement at the very outset. So this would be inspired by my mother. And uh, I've integrated myself into this work for my whole lifetime. And that was a quite a full on negotiation with Fingal County Council and the Fingal County Council Arts Department. And I continue to work in the project and I continue to develop it. Uh, one of the fabulous things about Fingal County Council as art department, of which Caroline Cowley, who's here, who's the public art coordinator for us, that it's artist led. Um, and there's great negotiation between Caroline and myself. But one thing I'd really like to point out uh, in this presentation is that um, the sticking power of the commissioner or the public art coordinator or the curator is just huge, uh, my experience. And I've been working, kind of making work since, for, since 1994. But, you know, you have a lot of projects where people generally might get disinterested. And for me, the sticking power and the commitment of the person who you're uh, working with to help realize your idea is so important. And I'm extremely grateful for that. And, um, you know, I'd like to mention also Jenny Houghton, who is uh, a huge part of my work uh, at um, Grange Gorman in, in, in realizing, uh, you know, a really difficult project and, uh, you know, it's for, it can be hard. And for the next project, I'm going to show uh, Michelle Kinsley, who is my project coordinator for uh, Heat FM. And he, you can go and, and hear the archive of this as well at heatfm.com. Um, Heat FM uh, was uh, not percent for art funded. It's it's funding through the Arts Council's Open Call Award, which is an amazing award. And um, uh, this was for the uh, 1916 
uh, centenary in celebration. And I, I submitted a radio station that would be a portrait of young people 18 to 25 in the greater Dublin area from all backgrounds. And it would look specifically at their uh, passions and their aspirations. And, um, and it would all be predominantly about them rather than me or putting my name to anything. It was very much a project focused on, on young people. And uh, we worked with many agencies and we worked with many young people over a very long period of time. And um, it was, again, very bureaucratic to achieve and go through all the work and to uh, put everything in place um, to, to uh, achieve it. Um, the project was strictly anonymous and uh, it was a, it was, um, I think one of the things that I have here is that uh, uh, we we got the uh, we got these guys to contribute their own work to the branding of a radio station. The branding of a radio station is very important part of my work, and uh, you know, so rather than me going out, which would be a huge part of what I would enjoy, in fact, about making a station, I handed that entirely over to uh, to these guys, and they. Uh, we invited people through no um, selection process whatsoever. We worked with many young people, like I say, but we just invited them to offer us their work. Uh, and we said unconditionally that we'd place it throughout Dublin City on, on posters throughout Dublin City. So, and that is a huge engagement in advertising with the public. And, and it was a huge, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think uh, the young people really enjoyed, um, um, you know, giving giving us their work and 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 seeing their work being really realised in, in in on a platform like this for the first time. So it was, it was a, you know, I referred to them not as participants but as contributors. Um, I, I'm not really interested. I find a lot of difficulty around the word participants, but. Contributor for me is is much better word because they were giving much more than than um, than anything really, and uh, we we got some incredible work from these people, and uh, it's also part of the archive which is available. Um, yeah. So uh, through the course of meeting these and, and visiting the city, you know, going and going to every single aspect of the city. I, uh, this project, like I say, was about them, but I was left with a lot of uh, questions unanswered. And um, that's quite difficult when you spend maybe three or four years working on a project and uh, so many questions arise. And, and, uh, and what uh, two questions that, um, sorry, I always take nice portraits of people uh, kind of to mark the kind of documentation of the bureaucratic thing of the like, signing of the license for a radio station. So, um, but one of the big issues for me was uh, the issue of class inequality of Dublin. And when young people talk to you and, and speak to you about their aspirations and passions, and uh, what we realized is that an awful lot of these passions and aspirations uh, wouldn't necessarily be re realised for these young people, and there's a great unfairness uh, around that. And uh, you know, I became, I suppose, really quite politicised uh, um, through the course of engaging, because every single person that I met was fantastic, regardless of what their background was, or what they did, or what crime they committed, or what success they had in life. And um, everybody was was weirdly, you know. And it sounds very hippy dippy, but everybody was 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 extraordinary, and each person was unique. And you know, you get a bond with people um, that can be sometimes unbreakable and difficult to manage. So, uh, Georgina Jackson, who's another wonderful person, uh, Dr. Georgina Jackson, who is the director of the Douglas High Gallery, approached me to make another project, and and this project uh, was. Uh, about really the access of um, the inequality, class inequality of Dublin City and the complications and complexity around access to third level or education and to look at the education system in Ireland, which prevents people from really achieving aspiration and, and passion and their passions. So I set about creating this project. And uh, again, hugely in the public realm, uh, we did a massive um, custom 
uh, poster uh, campaign. I hired, as part of uh, the artwork, I hired a, a marketing agency called Think House Dublin. And we set about trying to uh, um, look and examine um, how we can get information to help people who uh, come from very difficult backgrounds to gain access to information uh, to help them achieve third level education where they might be aware of that information and wouldn't necessarily go into third level education. So um, that was a huge, uh, and we created booklets and different paraphernalia. Uh, and we spent a lot of time with copywriters and copy editors trying to create the correct language to shift the bureaucratic language into a more common language so that um, people could understand a lot of the jargon that is preventative in making people uh, access funds uh, um, so we did a lot of work like that. And then um, we this radio station, Free Thought FM, again, you can go online and here, there's a free archive of it. We brought in different academics and different experts looking at how class, the class uh, inequality in Dublin City uh, manifested itself over centuries, uh, which was incredibly fascinating. And uh, we brought in different human geographers from Maynooth and different politicians. And we had a lot of people. We also made it available uh, so that if a member of the public wants to come in, they could talk openly. And the radio, sta all my radio stations are 24 seven. They uh, don't have uh, jingles or advertising or music, or it's just straight conversation. So initially when I started AIRT, it was all about sound and the experimentation of sound. But then I became much more kind of politicized the older I've got, basically as a father or a homeowner or whatever, you know, have to pay taxes, et cetera, et cetera. I found myself becoming much more politicized. So um, that is uh, Free Thought FM. And it wasn't just my voice being the presenter. I made sure that that, uh, uh, we're, we're very conscious. That's Michelle Kinsel on the bottom right there. And, Michelle and myself would think tirelessly and very hard and research heavily how we could make it as uh, approachable and accommodating to all kind of ideologies as possible. Um, and that are DIT, that's a, a selection of DIT students who came in and we had a conversation with, uh, or sorry, TU University ones, apologies, Kieran for that one. Um, so, and that basically is the poster campaign. And now the Golden Bandstand Sculpture, which I'm producing for uh, GGDA and Grange Gorman. Um, so that is the base of the Golden Bandstand Sculpture. And I'm in the middle of, I put that there because I think, you know, it's kind of what it is at the moment. And there is a lot of negotiation involved in achieving it. There are many, many different state stakeholders. There are many, many different um agencies involved in trying to uh, achieve and realize the idea there's a huge amount of bureaucracy in this pro project because there's so many different um stakeholders uh, but that's okay it's all part of it uh, and i'm very very up for, for dealing with all of that uh, like i say there's a core personal buy-in on every project that i do and and having that there makes me not walk away um, and and it's really how i tie myself into doing projects uh, and i i don't apply for every single public art thing i see very i actually apply for very little when i want to do something and it's something very important for me to communicate outwards i i, I go for it full tilt and and uh, there's a huge, you know, thing where you buy in and you you do your application and you and you put your concepts and your idea together, and then you put in that application. And the worst thing that can happen to me in a scenario like that is that if it get if it gets rejected or or uh, I, I don't achieve it, uh, it hasn't happened yet. But I couldn't imagine what would happen if it did because I suppose I put so much uh, intense energy into into doing the project. Um, so hopefully through COVID being shut down and construction being shut down and construction costs going literally off the roof, we will achieve this. Uh, um, we aim, we're in fabrication for the Golden Bandstand already. And it will be a beautiful, shining little uh, light of positivity and a fantastic site. To what, for me, 
watching Grange Gorman shift from what I grew up in as a Dubliner, which was this terrifying building, which was a psychiatric hospital, and manifest itself into this hugely innovative, forward-thinking uh, place of education, as Kieran, you know, presented at the start, which is staggering to see a shift like that in 30 years. Uh, and, and for me, it's, it's wonderful and it celebrates the work of one of the very first registrars in the building, sir, um, it was Joseph Lawler. And the way he dealt with mental health is that he dealt it through the arts and through literacy. And so I'm using that as a celebration of that while integrating my own uh, symbols, which you aren't seeing really here. And, uh, and it, this idea of art and functionality, it'll, it'll, it, it, it is, and the Hyde sculpture, for example, are principally and fundamentally sculptures, but they're sculptures that intermittently will have functionality. And that's really the area that I'm really exploring now at the moment. And that's a tiny sketch of what it might look like, <laughs> not revealing too much. And it'll have beautiful railings with idea icons of birds and microphones and, and, and ideas like that. So I just like to leave, leave and end my little bit with this. Um, which is, I hope I'm not being too patronizing putting something like this up, but every negative could actually be a positive. That's, that's, that's Caroline and, and my uh, little, little thing uh, that we've developed over the years. And it's so true. You know, we have been given so many negatives when we were producing the Hyde Project, but we did and we sat down and we thought very clearly about things and we turned that into some fabulous positives. And one of the big positives was um, making the Hyde sculpture wheelchair accessible in the most beautiful way you can imagine and if i go back to uh the the uh the uh, the, the gold the the golden bandstand sculpture you'll see that that's very much part of my work now so the spiral entry point where those men are standing and will revert around so it's a completely accessible work uh and i really love that idea uh, and taking each kind of learning aspect of the project's uh, uh, component and new new area of my work and bringing it forward. So the work's constantly developing and moving forward. So I will shut up now and leave it at that. And my last line is love bureaucracy. <laughs> You're on mute, Caroline. Sorry, thank you very much, Gareth. That was brilliant. Um, Obviously, we we know a lot about our high sculpture journey, um, um, but I just wanted to maybe ask you for the panel and for the audience a little bit more about like the fact that your practice is so multi layered. Um, you're not defined as a public artist yet; you need the public to make your art. Um, and I suppose just with the various sites and places, and even funding that you access, the um, the the integrity of your practice and the manifestation of a work in a site has many agendas. And so if context is half the work, how do you use the site that you work in to create political narratives, which might be uneasy in parts, in easy, uncomfortable conversations, but then also remain very much kind of an inherently, I don't know, joyful artwork. Ooh, um, you know, I think the, yeah, um, yeah, I don't use the term public art. I, you know, I, I don't define myself as just an artist. And uh, I suppose all spaces are public. And uh, that's the first thing. Like, I wouldn't distinguish between a, doing a project in, in, a, in an art gallery, if I'm answering this right, in an art gallery, uh, whatever size, and, you know, Grange Gorman or, or radio. They both have... Um, yeah, I don't believe that there's something like a neutral space or a non-political space. I think every space has a politic to it and every space um, has a process of where you buy, you have to have uh, very intense negotiations around it because you're, because as artists, I think that we're always trying to protect the integrity of what we're doing, but that's a negotiation, you know? Um, and I think, I think it's about the power of negotiation and how, um, you know, I've learned over the years not to take things personally. Um, I think that's a big kind of part and parcel of, of 
what I do when I'm making something. You know, you do initially, you'll go away and you go, oh, but fucking whatever. And then I'll go away and then I'll go, okay, filter it through, take a little bit of time. And then I go, okay, no, no, that makes sense. Uh, and so, but that happens in every single creative situation where, you know, displaying or presenting something comes into uh, play, you know. Uh, I don't know if I've answered some of it. Just if, uh, like, so if you're you're thinking about the funding, so the funding for kind of large scale public works in like the case of the bandstand, it's come from the Grange Gorman um, fund for for the high project, it's from Fingal, and some of the other projects are always, you know, they're arts council, they're state sanctioned. The sa the state or the government bodies are, you know, they're I suppose they're empowering you to make your work, but yeah. the work that you maybe make or the results that might kind of um come out of the processes i suppose with different you know with around the education system around the maybe direct provision that you've looked at um even around kind of um eco ecology like out somewhere like the high the contentious it sort of it brings up those kind of content maybe more le less comfortable maybe narratives for the funder and I know what you mean that you you're you're saying that like it's it's a negotiation, but I suppose that's always what you're kind of we always think about with public art is the conditions of its creation or the the opportunity like the opportunity that the conditions have been created to actually to make the work also are very loaded with a lot of obviously bureaucracy, but also a lot of um a oh, lot, maybe yeah. a lot of censorship, maybe in a way. Yeah. I, I don't know. Well, you have to sell it. I mean our job, our job. My job and your job and everybody's job here is to set, is to research the idea, look at it, really research it, make sure we don't make any gigantic errors of judgment. And then we pitch the sale to the to the to the funding agency and without compromising the idea. Like we can't ever kind of compromise the integrity of the idea once we believe in the idea and that the idea needs to be addressed. So for me, Georgina in Trinity College Dublin, for example, you know, Trinity College Dublin is one of the most elite, well, is the most elite educational institution in the country. So Free Thought FM directly was challenging that, but had the sanctioning of the provost and had the sanctioning of, of all of the agencies involved in that to go about and, and do that because it's an issue that I feel that most Dubliners want to deal with which is this massive class inequality in the city so we didn't have any issues with the broadcast authority of ireland challenging those issues because i think most people experience class inequality and know it exists and know there's poverty in dublin and know there's wealth in dublin and know that the two really clash so what was interesting is that i, I customized the you know the, this poster project so if you go to the ipa which is very much part of my practice and it's been a template part of my practice for a long time you go to the irish poster advertising company you know mary and garrett in there will turn around to me and say we can't be political it's not it's against our guidelines to be political so you can't advertise or be political on these posters so we had to sit down with copywriters and figure out okay let's figure out a way that we can be political but not compromise the 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 legalities for the ipa so we said about creating this poster campaign to be able to do things like that so it, it's 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 very labor intensive but it's completely manageable and it's worth the effort so uh, i don't know if i've answered any anything there for you you have and i suppose just we we touched on it with the with the other some of the other speakers as well and, and jenny's um conversation around the, the kind of outline for you i mean from a you know with the process that you undertake with all the other you know with all the other agencies there is a retention of autonomy of of you as an artist that does it allow you to hide a little bit does it does, or, or are you or are you completely no but you're, you're, you're yeah i think artists are front they're front loaded you know no i'd never i'd never uh think about it in that way no it's it's comes down to us um, and we conceive it um, and it's down to us and we realize it and we have to push everybody we have to set not push but we have to <laughs> bad word um uh, we have to you know uh we have to it, we're constantly selling the difficulty when you're making a long project particularly around something like in the ggda is that i find myself over and over and over and over and over and over again. I couldn't, I could keep on saying that and 
bore everybody in tears, but selling the project. So you, you're selling the same idea over and over and over and over and over and over and over. That that's the difficult bit because sometimes you go, oh, Jesus, there's another new person that's just walked in that I have to present the concept and I have to start from scratch. Or if someone leaves the job uh, whose vital role uh, and suddenly they've left and someone else comes in and you, I now have to sit down and sell that over and over. The artist is always at the front, I think. Um, so I'm just conscious of the time and thank you, Gareth, and we'll come back to you in a few minutes. I'm going to put you back to Brian. Um, how are we for time? We're doing we're doing OK. I just like to invite Jenny. Speaking of front loading artists, Gareth, I'd just like to invite Jenny and Alex back in um, to this if you want to knock on your cameras. Um, we have a little bit of time for some general questions. And again, I'd ask anybody in the audience, please feel free to um, drop in any questions and we'll do our very best to 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 get to them in the time that we have. There is one question here and I'm just going to direct it to 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 everybody. And it's, it's very much of a practical nature. Budget and artwork often do not come together easily. Do you think the budgets on offer do reflect the real cost of the artwork and artwork and artist fees, especially with lots of engineering costs, design costs and material costs involved? Alex, I might ask you to respond to that one first. Um, it's um, yes, no, I think is my basic answer. I mean, it depends on the project. Um, I mean, I, I find actually with the smaller scale artworks and the um, temporary interventions, there is more room generally um, because there's less engineering and, and you, you don't have to think about the legacy of the artwork and the maintenance and all of that. Um, I, I think now is a time that's it's difficult for me to answer that because in the midst of Brexit and COVID, doing my first major permanent commission, um, we've been really, really up against it. You know, like the goalposts change daily and you know, will it all come together, will it not? Um, and small changes make really significant impacts on the budget. So in this current climate, no, but, but the, the thing is we, we weren't anticipating that. Um, and I think moving forward, budgets probably need to be adjusted for that because this is something we're, we're living with long term. Um, having said that, I think um, there's, there's been a, a COVID induced reaction to the, the permanence of artwork and how we reach different audiences globally without any physical artwork, you know, it changes engagement, it, it changes legacy, it changes everything. So I think that might shift in the future and people are becoming much more inventive in what they produce. Um, but on the whole, and, and this may change, the, the bigger the project, maybe you sort of reach, you, you go over a hump, I'm not sure, but the, the larger projects are much, much more labor intensive. So the, the proportion you have for the artist's fees isn't really commensurate with the actual work involved. Uh, as Garrett said, it, like these, these things are really, really labor intensive. Um, when you're doing something for the first time, you can't ever really gauge when that's going to end. You can't quantify that. So um, yeah, the larger works are, are, are tougher in terms of project uh, uh, profit margins, but they're exciting and they're ambitious and we can't sort of, it's a bit of an obsession really. You, you can't turn away from it, can you? Yeah. Jenny, does that have a resonance for you? I mean, obviously it's not the kind of, you know, the discussion around engineering that both Gareth and um, Alex were having, but the notions of budget must obviously impact within a kind of discursive format too. You know, absolutely. I think um, it's something that um, I have to constantly manage actually, you know, to kind of ensure safe passage, whether or not it's an art school project of the artist to the school and from the school and, and actually manage expectations of, of, of the school, sometimes the commissioner. Um, so sometimes that those kind of expectation, expectations are something that you have to constantly manage. And I think with art schools specifically, given that it's modus operandi, it's always, it, it, it does change from, from project to project. So um, like Garrett's, I've had to really come to love bureaucracy so whether or not it's the outline or it's you know which ensures the safe passage of the artist into the school where they, they can just front face as as themselves uh, using that as a device 
but then also um, writing proposals has has become such a thing because um, and often for you know kind of smaller pockets of funding not you know um, large um, so it has to become very adaptive to, to that but of course really keeping the idea of, of, of the of the things that you want to respond to anyway so whether or not it's it's a seismic shift happening in a, the city of Dublin like with Grange Gorman or um, something around you know marriage equality and, and, and kind of creating a thematic around that in in, in rural Roscommon or you know rural Ireland um, so it's yeah so again <laughs> I've gone off topic but it, it is something that um, that is just you, you do have to constantly manage. I'm doing just with 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 another question here as well. Um, and again, I just throw this out for everybody. How do you balance the idea of the artist as a temporary and it might be said privileged person intervening with various communities and the danger of being seen as offering token gestures? And it might be said offering temporary dreams. What is the very long term? Sorry, which in the very long term are far from sustainable? Have any of the speakers implemented long term impact studies? Cara, will I throw that grenade over to you? Oh, it's a brilliant question, and I love it. And uh, I, I've set up this agency, not an agency, I've set up this thing called Heed Office. And, uh, you know, and I became really conscious and aware that, you know, I, I, I'm a Belvedere middle class uh, private school educated uh, man, boy. And, you know, when I went to work, uh, to work with people, most of the people, well, a lot of the, 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 the young people thought I was an undercover policeman, which, um, you know, and, and I couldn't get past as many certain doors for exactly the same reason. I'm, I'm, but I was very cognizant, you know, not to offer dreams, you know, because it's such a delicate space and area, you know. Um, we put huge effort into uh, our management of um, how we engaged with people, massive effort and energy. And, and you know, we always tried to, you know, uh, it was, it, it, you know, we, it, the, I, this, I, this word trust, you know, it's, you know, I didn't really go there with people uh, because, you know, I don't even trust myself half the time. So why would I try and get people to trust me? So it was about a contract. It was, it was contractual and it was about paying where absolutely it's possible. And so I set up this thing called Heed Office, try and say it really quickly. Uh, and, and Heed Office is uh, where we would mentor uh, self-determined project so if you're you're if you're young and you want to you want to know how to get funding you want to know how to go about doing it you want me to fundraise for you and show you how to do it and show you how to administrate and show you how to deal with all of that bureaucracy I, I'm here 100% for free I'll do it for you so I'm selling that now to people and uh, I'm okay. pleased spread the word. yeah I'm pleased spread the word please spread the word because that's I call that give back and mm. and not like you know and i think that's really important so we set up heat office but i interestingly there's only one taker of that in the six years i've had it so i've left it sitting there and i've only had one taker you know and i think that that's a symbol that shows me really how much people want me in in their lives so i've i have to learn and understand and and figure that out because you know a lot of the time these young people just want you to fuck off give them money or make them famous Mm -hmm. uh, and we learned that and I learned that the hard way because I do come in all goody two shoes wanting to save the world like Caroline says at the end of her introduction to me you know and it's that's, it's not real you know. Kind of underlying that I suppose and it cuts across Jenny and, and um, Alex is, is, is the notion of ethics I suppose I mean obviously within a school or an educational format and working with children as well Jenny there's that huge ethical issue around engagement and mm -hmm. you know, what's on a cur curriculum, et cetera. But also, Alex, you were kind of bringing up around the, the, the ethics of making, you know, and the ethics of, you know, extracting material. But I just wonder if I go to Jenny first, how, 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 does, how, does, that, how, how does that ethical balance play out for you? I think it's about um, agency, that if the project can kind of garner a particular agency, um, 
regardless of the, the duration of the project, whether or not it's um, a, a few weeks or months, um, I think, and I guess with um, the modus with what I try to, to kind of manifest through the projects is that the artists are working collaboratively with the students. So, um, so if, so in, in a sense, the legacies, it's, it's, it's an embodied experience that you can, once it's there, it's, 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 it's a lived thing. And, and then sometimes very practically in, in, um, in some of the projects where, where the students have to kind of pitch an idea to their principal to drill a hole through the wall, or they have to, so again, it's that kind of, it's that agency that um, so again, it's 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 a moment. It's it is a fleeting moment, but it's 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 for me. It's about agency. Is is um is kind of passing th through the school. So for me, that's um kind of such a poignant uh, gesture. And and again, um, Claire Butcher's essay uh, right at the end of the book actually deal deals with that because a lot of artists say, um, for example. I'm thinking of Sarah Pierce's work where she was talking about um, she was doing Tableau Vivant and, and was working with Bertolt Brexit, like Lair Stucca, the learning play. And, you know, plays, again, are, are kind of momentary things, um, but she kind of really works very well through a practice, like a complex practice such as Sarah Pierce's, that then kind of touches on, on, on how it works with, with the students and, 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 and how do you measure it? How do you measure it anyway? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just wondering then, Alex, just about that, 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 that issue you brought up, maybe COVID enforced, but around kind of the ethics of materiality and all, how is that playing out for you now? Um, well, I mean, the ethics of, of having uh, an artistic practice in itself is an ongoing issue because I, don't, I can't speak for all artists, but I, a, a lot that I speak to, and I certainly feel this very strongly, that there's a lot of guilt involved with having an artistic practice because it does feel very self-indulgent. I mean, a lot of the time you have to learn to love bureaucracy like Garrett does. It's, you know, you're mo a screen most of the time, but you sort of, you put these things out into the world and question um, its validity. If it's, it's make, you know, are you contributing to the world in any way, which is why, um, what Garrett was saying about how these objects or structures having purpose really resonates with me, which is, I think, what brought me towards working with the sciences in the first place and being really interested in the hybrid space because you feel like you're actively contributing to something um, constructive, something that's going to do some good in the world, um, which I, is why I've sort of gravitated towards these really progressive scientists. Um, so I think it's an ongoing process. You know, I think any art, artist worth their salt is constantly um, self-critical and self-analyzing and, and sort of reiterating through its own sort of, um, I don't know the word, but it, it's an ongoing process of deconstructing everything you've done before, seeing its worth and then putting it back together to, to get to the next level. So, I mean, that that's where the ethics of making and, and addressing material has come from for me. And it, I, I will probably very characteristically take it to its obsessive extreme because at, at times I've described my practice as just an expression of my existential angst. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just working it out all the time, you know? Um, but it's, Thanks, it's, sorry, sorry, it's, I beg your pardon. I, I'm I'm just looking at our at our at our clock here. There are yeah. two quick two um, other just um, uh, questions. Um, uh, one might be um, a quick one. Garrett, diverse audiences. Were there diverse audiences on site? The Douglas side? Oh, huge. Yeah, huge. we put massive energy into every single kind of community that lives in the greater Dublin area. So every single community pretty much uh, was represented in space and uh, yeah no we and what we tried really hard not to make it a, a, a tick a box taken exercise that was really you know we, we 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 really sat down and scrutinized our own kind of process and made sure that it was sorry yeah thanks 
and just the, the, the very last one I see is just around the kind of legacy around um, maybe the nature of what you're working with. Um, somebody who's working on a project in the city of Melbourne in 2012 before refugee issues came to the fore, um, funding only for materials, not, and um, there was there, a lot of stories were very difficult around loss, grief, camaraderie, um, but that there was no kind of, if I'm, if I'm reading this correctly, there was no follow up for the for the for the artists within that as well too, and the legacy of, of that. So perhaps that's something about one project feeding into the other, and what an artist takes from it, and what they learn from working with different communities. Um, Caroline, we've we've got to wrap up, don't we? We have to wrap up. Um, I would just like to um, just sum up uh, just a little bit of what um, we've spoken about today, and I just think what you just touched on it there about the trace on on a work that's durational um, being left on the artist and you know even thinking about Beckett's famous quote about failing again and also even beginning again at different sites and I, I just feel that this is sort of an ongoing conversation which I'm sure everyone will unpack further over the course of the conference in the next few days. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to thank um, TU Dublin, Brian Fay, uh, Grania and the team, Kieran and the team there in um, in Grange Gorman. Our brilliant panellists today, Alexandra Carr, Jenny Guy and Garrett Phelan for their insightful and thoughtful comments and um, descriptions of their works and their process and practice. We could talk all day with you guys. Um, I'll leave you by saying enjoy the rest of the conference. We'll probably all see each other on some chat or Q&A box soon and um, have a great day. Thank you. So I just want to remind people this, um, the next, um, after lunch, the next session is conversation two, which is public art and policy. And it'll be shared by Kieran Benson, who's the head of the Grinch Gorman uh, Public Art Working Group. And also to remind people at seven o'clock this evening, there's, uh, there's a featured lecture uh, on the connections and complexity at the US-Mexican border. So there's a full day of public art discussion if people would, um, would like to uh, get stuck in on the very first day. Please do look at the programme and the curriculum. There are uh, lunchtime um, performances and talks that you have access to as well with Broken Talkers. And we really hope that you enjoy the next few um, uh, uh, sessions. We hope we've, we've maybe front loaded a lot of very relevant and pertinent issues. And uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. And thank you, Caroline, uh, for co-chairing as well. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Gareth, Bye. Alexander, and Jenny. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.